Hello everybody. Korea Shut Up and Sit Down fans might remember that in the sweet, sweet summer of 2015 we reviewed Samurai, a new Wind Rider edition of one of the greatest games ever made by board gaming legend Rainer Knizia. And then in the summer of 2016, we reviewed the new edition of Ra, also by Windrider Games, also a near-perfect box by Rainer Knizia. And you know what that means. It's time for our annual summer good time tile laying Rainer Stravaganza 2017! <laughs> Matthew, are you there? I am here! Yes, Quentin, it's time for the Rainer Stravaganza. I'm hot, I'm ready, let's go. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Today on Rhinus Stravaganza 2017, we've got Tigris and Euphrates, which is Italian for tigers and pots. And that's why two of the factions in the game are traditional Italian pots and traditional Italian tigers. And just like tigers, you know what? This game is rawly amazing. It's really amazing. You build great cities which then join with other cities and then you have wars and leaders get killed and cities fall apart like Galaxy Tracker spaceships and your once great empire is now sort of in bits but it's fine because you can host a rebellion and gosh this game is an exciting dynamic little puzzle with a bright three-dimensional board that pops off your table. People will walk past and say, ooh, what are you playing? And you can say, I'm playing Tigers and Pots, Mum. You had your choice to join in. Now get out of the shed. Looking at these bright colours and chunky plastics, you might assume that Tigers and Pots is as excellently simple as Samurai or Ra. And it is, but it can be quite tricky to teach. So the objective is to get the most of these lovely victory points. On your turn, you get two action. And an action is either placing one of the six secret tiles behind your screen on the board, or placing one of your leaders adjacent to one of these red tiles. When you place a tile on top of a city, it generates a victory point of that color but not necessarily for you. It goes to the person who has the leader. So in the case of here, this green pot would be sucked up by Matt's green line and that would go behind his screen. If this city did not have a green leader, however, there's one special rule, which is that victory points that don't have anyone to go to will go to a king if there is one. And look, my king's here, which means I get the green thing, Matt doesn't, it's mine. So you pop your leader next to a temple and you start building a little city and getting some of your points for your little city. And what could be more peaceful and lovely? And look, if you position four tiles of the same type together, then you can even make a traditional Italian monument. And that will then generate victory points for the leaders of those colors of that city every single turn. But I uh, know the world is tiny and humans are naturally drawn to conflict like moths to a moth cake. And that means that when two little cities love each other very much and get close to each other, they become one big city. And in the process of that happening, there is a war. And wars usually always result in at least one person around the table putting their head in their hands and going, Aah! During this wonderful cultural exchange, the connecting tile is covered by this special unification trial, and then any new rivalries are sorted out by the time-honored tradition of killing people in the street. Bellissimo! In this example, we have a blue and a red leader, but crucially, the person who put down the tile gets to decide which of these conflict happened first. And that's important because whichever leader loses the conflict is removed along with all of the tiles that supported them, potentially breaking up your new super city into lots of little itty bitty cities. That's an Italian term. These battles cause seismic shifts in the whole landscape of the map. And the one minute you'll be getting ready for a massive war to try and seize the capital, and then things break away and suddenly you realize you're going to war over a small car park. But wars aren't just inevitable, they're constantly encouraged. Made because of treasure. Basically, every time you join two cities together, bum, 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 if there's two treasures or more, then whoever has a green leader attached gets to take all but one of those treasures. And treasures act as wild victory points, which means at the end of the game they can be used as any type of VP, which is huge for reasons that you will understand very soon.
But the reason your tiles are all hidden behind your screen is because your strength in a war is the number of like colored tiles for the leader plus however many you bid from behind your screen. So in this case, my strength is one, two, three, and I'll bid zero because secretly I don't have any red tiles. But then for every piece that gets removed, that gives your opponent a victory point. That's one, two, three, four red victory point to my opponent. That's so many VPs. Oh, but. But oh, but, but, but oh, that's not even the best thing. We've saved the best thing to last. Your score of the game isn't the number of VPs you have behind your thing, no. You count up each of the types of VPs you have and whichever you have the least of, whichever score of those is the lowest score, that's your score. But Matt, I have 24 green victory points. Yes, but you've only got three blue ones, which means your score is three. But that's a bad score. Yes. This scoring system whereby you need to get an even spread of stuff is awesome for one very important reason. It stops you from just getting trapped in endless grudge wars because yeah sure maybe for a couple of turns you dominate the rivers and you get loads of blue points but then someone ousts you and kicks you out. Do you fight to get it back? Probably not, no. You don't really need any more blue points. You need some reds. So you go and do something else. And the thing about this is it means it's this endless carousel of wars whereby you're never that bother when someone comes and steals something away from you because by that point you're usually focused on what you're going to go and steal next. And the easiest way to steal something is with a simple mechanic called revolts. If you've got a leader like this green guy who I don't think I could have beaten in a war with all his green markets, you can always just boop, pop a leader down and have a quick one-on-one -on -one battle that uses the number of temples adjacent to you as strength. And that can eliminate a leader and leave the city intact. And then you can shore up your own position against revolts by placing more temples around your leader. Mwah. And Billy Catastrophe. Oh no, not Billy. This bad little boy is always trouble, whether he's on his way home from the pub right now, honestly, scaling a wall like classic Batman, or on his way home from the pub right now, honestly, but if you could come and pick me up, actually that would be great. Each player has two Billy Catastrophe tiles. Placing one effectively destroys a place. Billy! Oh my god! What have you done? More importantly, what does that do? Well, it might oust a leader, or split up cities, or provide you with the perfect opening for a coup. Billy, was that your plan all along? It's just a constant platter of delicious choices. You've got big power plays, you've got empires falling, you've got unstoppable kings just suddenly being stopped. And despite the secrecy of tiny cardboard screens and the thrill of dropping a big bid, having no idea whether or not your opponent can match it, so much of the game takes place in this shared, visible, constantly readable space. It means you're never squirreled away in your own little world, reading tiny text on a card or looking at pieces or making plans or trying to get your head around your own personal engine. No, you exist here in this vibrant world and it means that you can constantly be there just to appreciate the quality of other plays being made and other players are just appreciating the quality of the plays that you're making. And for me personally it's this appreciation of one another's moves on the table that makes Tigers and Pots a classic. Okay? There's this trope within all depictions of board games across all continents on this planet which I call hmm a fine move, and you can even see this in historical depictions of board games. Prithee, take thy move upon yonder board. Very well. I shall move yonder knavish bishop upon yonder square. Oh, a fine move. Wouldst thou like to go for a yonder upon yonder pub later and drink perhaps Four or five yonders? Verily! And this trope even extends to depictions of board games in science fiction. Quins, are you almost done taking your move in Future Chess 3000? Absolutely.
Hmm. A fine move. The aliens have found us. The aliens found you quite some time ago. You're an alien! Yes. You also see this in every single depiction of poker in a movie. If there is a game on a table in a human story, someone is going to do something incredible and everyone else is going to be impressed. And yet, this moment of games at their most transcendent and illustrative of human wit and guile is almost completely absent from the board games that Shut Up and Sit Down reviews. Not so, at least, with Tigris and Euphrates, when someone can place a catastrophe tile to prevent two cities from fusing and everyone else around the table can go, hmm, that's a damn fine move. And you'll keep saying that. You'll keep having realizations repeat on you as if you'd eaten a questionable puzzle prawn. A city with a lot of same colored tiles will, upon contact with another civilization, cause the opposing leader to explode. You'll come to realise that monuments are spectacular victory point generators, but they also dictate where wars are fought. And then you'll realise that when you flip four tiles face down to create a monument, you remove the power base of that colour of leader, which can be terrible or amazing. There are lots of games that Shut Up and Sit Down has reviewed that I really want to play a dozen times and get quite good at. Tigris, I want to chase mastery of it, but I know that chasing mastery of this game is going to be like being a kitten chasing a laser beam because there are just so many layers on which it operates. There are additional components in the box too. If you want to mix it up, you can play with a module that introduces a weird super monument that spews out a victory point of that king's choice. There are special civilization places where if you build in a long line, you can create a district which spews out double victory points. And on the reverse of this board, there is another board that offers a different setup with trickier rivers and more treasure. Each and every time I sit down to play Tigris, I arm an R over the new additions and then just decide, nah, I just want that same blank canvas. I want me and my friends to fill it with monuments and mistakes and tiles and trials and thrills. And in what may be a first for Shut Up and Sit Down, as soon as Matt and I are done filming, we've actually agreed to just play a two-player game of Tigris and Euphrates because yep. that's how much we like this game. So, uh, it should be clear now, Shut Up and Sit Down recommends Tigris and Euphrates and we think £40 or $50 if you can get it for that price online is an excellent price for this beautiful new edition with the extra stuff inside it. But, 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 we've got but. a special message for you before we go here. The thing is, this is amazing. I love it, but it, it might it, not... It is honestly a marvel. It might not be for everybody, though. No. So here's the thing. I mean, no board game is for everybody, we don't think. But when we review or recommend a game like Werewolf or Resistance, if you don't like lying, you don't buy those games. If you aren't good with numbers, then don't buy Power Grid or, necessarily, Netrunner. But human society doesn't really have a name for this kind of thinking. What is it? It's like puzzly... It's kind of visual, abstract... Pattern recognition... There's a lot going on here, and even though it's not the traditional complexity, the sort of things that I don't like, like, you know, working out algebra or doing double figure maths, this is all super simple on that level, but in terms of complexity of patterns and complexity of options, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. So I think it may be just that you should think a little harder about whether there's someone in your friend group who might destroy people if given the opportunity. Because my god, Tigris gives you the opportunity. Sorry, Tigers. Tigers, Tigers and gives pots. you the opportunity to destroy people. Because we were talking about it the other day, like, Ra is great in the fact that you can play it and everyone will get a bit of something. Yeah. You won't get completely left behind. In this, a couple of bad plays and you're just going to get trounced. It is perfectly possible for your score to be, you know, two. Yeah. That is not, that is, that is absolutely within the realms of possibility and you might have to be okay with that. Yeah, but if you are, then this game is awesome. Oh, it's so good. I think I'm going to lose when we play because it's going to be a really hot day. Yeah. But I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to lose. Sorry, Quinns, I was just thinking about history. Ah, verily, tis a return to the scene with the silly costumes as a means of ending the review. A fine move. A fine move. And behold, yonder, yonder in the yonder bushes, tis a barbarian. Tis a callback to an earlier video in place of an actual joke. Ah. A fine move. And talking of fine moves, have thou considereth 
subscribing to yonder YouTube video and liketh the vi- Ah! The Barbarian has murdered Quentin! A fine move! <clears throat> ah! Thank thou for watching and you can subscribe to- Ah! The Barbarian is murdering me! A fine move! A fine move! Ah! Uh, oh!